So this t mod function is divided into three. It is the alternative <coughs> where PS <coughs> puts its price marginally higher than PUS and captures zero where the price is just equal and they split the market and where QS just underbid marginally and capture the entire market and the entire market is <coughs> thousand <coughs> minus PS <coughs> and <coughs> When we go through this market now, <coughs> I will <coughs> end up in this lecture to reflect on the Norwegian petroleum industry because maybe one of our biggest company, Seedrin, <coughs> they are <coughs> a real company and the spot market price level for rigs has fallen dramatically. And why come? When the activity level will go down and we have homogeneous products and there will be overcapacity, the rig company starts to underbid each other all the way down <coughs> until they don't cover the fixed cost and then <coughs> within the Norwegian petroleum industry for the time being to some extent we can see a marketplace that's not very far from this <coughs> That's what the newspaper told me today. <coughs> sea drill, <coughs> a very successful company, <coughs> owned by a Norwegian, Fredriksen, no living in another country, <coughs> one of the richest men in the world, and <coughs> he has been very successful within this rig company, Sea drill, have contracted he has contracted heavily the last five years. His debt within this company is 100 billion. Norwegian Krona is in debt. And now, <coughs> when the prices will fall, <coughs> the value of the company will fall. But he is rich enough to survive. Let's look at the market model. Next picture. <coughs> Let's now start and imagine that we have a price level of 400. Then the demand function will be the red horizontal line because if QS and the price level that will be mar marginally lower than US, marginally higher, they will have zero. So until QS reach the level 400, the market is for QS zero exactly when the price level is 400 they split the market ending up in A and they have 300 each and now if QS underbid US modeling you have the demand curve starting at 600, sloping downwards. It's 
So this is the demand structure in this battle game. <coughs> then the two players will always underbid in trial. Do you think there is a first mover advantage here? <coughs> if you move first, what will your rival do? Underbid you moderately and capture the entire market. <coughs> so here's where you don't move first. So in a battle game, <coughs> you wait for your rival to move and then you underbid him moderately. Quite the opposite from the Konoge. Let's now look at <coughs> the Nash Agreement. Now, you have Southwest and US reaction curves. <coughs> they just start at 70.70. That is the marginal cost. When you end up with prices equal to marginal cost, there will be no incentives to move anything lower. So 70-70 is where the two players have no incentives to change. If they increase their price, they lose the entire market. <coughs> if they reduce they don't earn money, because to produce <coughs> a product with an income lower than the marginal cost, then you will lose money. So they end up underbidding each other <coughs> until they reach the marginal cost. <coughs> And there's where the whole game stops. Why? <coughs> because there is no incentives to move any further. <coughs> and they move along their reaction function, just underbidding each other, all the way down until they are captured in <coughs> a kind of precedence dilemma where they just cover the marginal cost. And there will be nothing left to cover the fixed cost. That is dramatic. And <coughs> if we look at the rig market, can we expect the rig market to go that far, that they go on underbidding each other all the way down <coughs> until <coughs> they don't cover anything of the fixed cost. <coughs> and just to remind you, the fixed cost for <coughs> sea drill the depth is more than 100 billion Norwegian dollars, 100 billion Norwegian kroners. So they have invested heavily. And the fixed cost is much higher than that. They invested heavily in rigs, new rigs for drilling. <coughs> and these rigs are already there. Do you think that he will have any incentive to sell them? 
No? Why not? Because in this period, nobody wants to buy them. So he will not sell. And if he, if he must sell, the price level will be very low. So we will just keep them. And once they are there, and they don't want to sell them, how far will he go to underbid his rival? If he will have a rig available, he can either choose to, to contract it for a price level that just, just cover the variable cost, or, or he could just have them out of business. And instead of putting them somewhere, doing nothing, he would definitely prefer to have them in operation. And when it's access capacity, that might finally end up in a price level that will be so low that it just cover the variable cost. Price equal to variable costs in equal to marginal cost. So he will be willing to go all the way down and who will gain from that? The oil companies. Why come? Yeah. So one part will lose, the oil companies will earn. So Statoil, the Norwegian company, we can be happy because the, the total cost will fall. That's good for us. So one loser, but always one winner big oil companies. So again, the oil prices today were 86. 86. And still, I say, don't worry. That's no problem for us. And it's good for the Norwegian economy that the activity level <laughs> Here in Norway is down. That is good for the Norwegian economy. And even though they have threatened to sack more than 5,000, that's not a very big problem. It's a big problem for that group. It's not a big problem for the Norwegian economy. And in 2013, the total turnover for the Norwegian petroleum industry. Can you guess how much the turnover for that sector was in 2013? That was all the companies producing different services and commodities to the New Indian continental shelf and to export. It was as much as 206 billion Norwegian crowns. 206 billion Norwegian crowns. That is a big sector. And do you know the future for them. Do you know how much of what's left on the Norwegian continental shelf 
that we have explored. We have been exploring for 45 years and we have exactly explored, exploited 45 percent. So we have 55 percent left. 55 percent left. Do you think they have a good future? What happens when the activity level now is reduced a little bit? They go to new markets? Yeah, uh, and where? Brazil. And where? Brazil, Brazil and the Arctic. Brazil mm -hmm. and Angola. Angola. Yeah. And Nigeria mm -hmm. and South Korea. Hmm? So Brazil. U.S. <laughs> yeah? They, they uh, uh. <laughs> Even Croatia. <laughs> uh, but in, uh, in the newspaper, the new big marketplaces that they enter is definitely first Brazil, second U.S., third uh, was Angola, fourth Nigeria and fifth South Korea and they just leave the Norwegian continental shelf and of course when they leave and move into Brazil they put pressure on the price level so the price level will go down all over and also in Nigeria so it's good for you. The price level will go down, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and all the Nigerian people will gain a much higher profit, and the, the Nigerian companies will also gain. <laughs> so good for you. Prices will go down, <laughs> and in the long run, then what will happen with this sector in Norway? Because now. They feel the pressure, they will definitely be more cost efficient in the long run. So, this is a learning by doing process. Now they are learning, the cost level has increased dramatically. And that is to a great extent labor costs. And that is because when I was a student, I worked on a rig. So in the summertime, when I come home, came home from the university, I went, that was in 1971, I went directly out to a rig. I stayed there for 14 days, and then I had 14 days free, and I went out again for 14 days. And I was rich. <laughs> I was rich. That has changed dramatically. In 1970, the turners was 14 days on and 14 days off. Do you know what it's now? Is that the offers uh, two weeks on with three weeks off or even four weeks off? Uh, now weeks it's 14 days on and one month off. That is expensive for the oil company. And even <coughs> with that turners, the average wage level is one million. So they have a lot of spare time to use their money. <laughs> They went travel to travel all over the world. <coughs> so this is where you can go for a new job. <laughs> Whatever you do, even though you're just doing cleaning, you earn a lot. 
and Arvina. So I know exactly how it is. And it was quite tough. I just had to look after myself. And several times I just saw that I was just close to very serious accidents. <coughs> and the leaders, they were from Texas, and they were just like homos. So it was a kind of strange leadership, very hierarchical, and they were driving us very hard. So I worked very hard, and I was just at the lowest level <laughs> because I was a student. So I just had to survive, and it was survival of the fittest. And I always saw <coughs> every week <coughs> some of my <coughs> colleagues were just sent home. <coughs> if they were not willing to work hard, <coughs> if they just opposed <coughs> these guys <coughs> from Texas, <coughs> and if these guys from Texas <coughs> didn't like you, they just put you on the helicopter and sent you home. But I survived. <laughs> and I, when I finished my degree in 1975, <coughs> and I come home to Stavanger, my hometown, and in my brief, in <coughs> I, I received a letter, and there <coughs> they asked me if I wanted a, a job this year. And I definitely saw <coughs> that even though I've studied <coughs> for six years, my salary would have been much higher if I'd gone for a job offer. That was even in 1979, four, and now it's worse. <coughs> but I, <coughs> I went for my academic career, so I started at the university instead of earning a lot of mm -hmm. <laughs> That was a signal. There is something out there that we call a signal game. In game theory, if I play, and when I say the signal, you immediately have received it, and you say <coughs> to yourself, okay, now it's weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely.